Fantastic. Fantastic. Glad somebody figured it out because I don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> See, Jeez. I figured I figured with all that uh, uh, broadcast studio stuff, you you would be all savvy with this. Turn mic on, talk. That's it. <laughs> Mike Golick and Mike Golick Jr. joining the show. What a pleasure to have you two. And um, Golick, you're looking good for retirement. Go- retirement's looking good on you. Well, it's doing okay, and it's hopefully semi-retirement. I'm not ready to just hang it up just yet. My wife doesn't want me around that much just yet. So <laughs> uh, a little break in the action, I guess we'll call it. Well, the you know, when I saw you smoking the cigar on your, um, right. on, on, on your Twitter, I was like, my my first thought was like this guy has got to drink whiskey if he's smoking a cigar like that because you had a pretty good you had a pretty good ash on it. It's like he's got to be pairing a little bourbon with that from time to time. Uh, well, that w- that was out on the golf course, so there was no whiskey out there. But uh, I certainly have done it some in the past. I am somewhat of a whiskey guy, not a huge whiskey guy. My son is way more a whiskey guy than I am. Oh, right on. So, uh, Golic Jr., when did you get into whiskey? Uh, you know what? I think I started shooting it in college like everybody else who was kind of a, a, a pig about it back then. And it's one of those things that as time goes along, and uh, I know you've had Kyle Rudolph on the show here as a good buddy of mine. You know, you hang out with him long enough and you kind of realize, all right, as I am now staring down 31 instead of 21, maybe low and slow on the heat on this one is probably a better way to go. And so I, I think as we've gone along with that, it's been a nice way to kind of relax at the end of the day as opposed to kickstart the party. Yeah, so when you were at Notre Dame, did you guys keep a little uh, something something in the in the locker room? <laughs> maybe not maybe not in the locker room necessarily. I don't know if we were quite that bold, but we all did live together. We had a nice uh, we had a nice condo near campus. Uh, that we had, you know, stocked with the usual stuff that you'd see in a college house. Maybe every once in a while, a bottle of Makers or something would make its way home. But in, in general, it was what could we get cheapest, quickest in that situation. And so we've got the the benefit of time and experience now. That's kind of that's kind of what college is. It's the cheapest and quickest. Uh, never in the locker room though. Nothing. Let me tell you, alcohol <laughs> and alcohol and football practice don't mix at all. So uh, you definitely definitely separate those two. Quite Although I, I can say I've seen people unfortunately mesh them a little too closely, and results vary at times. You know, when I, when I was in the army, you know that very very different. But like you'd have you'd have guys that would go party all night and then show up to formation the next day still still drunk, and I don't think you could pull that off in football. No, I had, no, you can't. I know, well, I was going to say I had I had one practice. It was during bowl season where, you know, the practices are a little more spaced out, a little fewer and further between. And, you know, you had a nice, long, hard night the night before, had one too many, and rolled into practice definitely not feeling my best, yet had one of the best practices of my life. Myself and another teammate who were both out kind of looked at each other at the end. And it's like, all right, we don't want to make a habit of this, but at the same time, that was exceptional work knowing what we had done the night before. Yeah, all I did was I, I've obviously done it because, you know, that age you're young and dumb. So I've done that a, a couple of times as well. And, man, the amount you sweat out and you just you just sit there and you pray, get me through this practice, and I swear I'll never do it again. But, unfortunately, you, you usually do it again because of how old you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had uh, Indomitian Sue on a while back, and he said, like, you really, you know, he's like, he won't, he won't, he won't, he loves bourbon. He sips it all the time. But, he won't really play with it um, during the season because it's all about recovery, you know. So now that neither one of you have to be up for for practice or you know, you got you have to get up early and do you know radio well, work. But well, when when I was getting up early, there there certainly was a, wasn't a lot of uh, social drinking at night. That's for sure. When you got to get up at four fifteen, but maybe now that uh, while I'm still doing work i'm not getting up that early anymore maybe some uh you know cocktail hours will come into play a little more are you sleeping in at all i yeah you know i still stir around 4 30 the time i've gotten up for 25 years but then i go back to sleep till about 7 or 7 30 so i get a little more a little more time in nice 
Well, gentlemen, I sent you all some uh, some pretty rare whiskey, and in fact, I sent you the last uh, sample of my uh, the last drops of my rhetoric twenty four year old. So I, I, either that or my my assistant drank the the last little bit of it, but I don't I don't have any left. So you two are gonna have to that rhetoric twenty twenty four year old. I don't have that to share with you, but what will what we will start with is we're going to start with this uh, Russell's uh, Reserve uh, private barrel. Now I sent you both a, a glass. You got you, you have the Glen Karen with you. Boom! Fantastic. So this is my favorite whiskey whiskey sipping glass. Um, you know, it's not one where you put ice in it. This is really just for like, you know, drinking, drinking neat. But this glass right here is like, you know, you can really, you can really assess the, you can assess the aromatic properties of it. You can, it hits the tongue just right. So this is by far the best whiskey glass. So as you're, as you're having that cocktail hour and you're wanting to, um, you know, you know, work on your palate or whatever, I recommend this glass uh, over over others. And now, this is a this is a private pick. So this is only this is a barrel that uh, somebody had picked. I think there's only a hundred. Um, it was only 130 bottles or something of this. So there was not a lot. So this is this is a very it's a once once in a lifetime kind of whiskey that you won't ever get again because every barrel is going to be different. Now, when you, when you look, when American whiskey is very different than like other types of whiskey, like scotch, especially bourbon, it's always going into a new charred oak barrel. So the color of bourbon is, is really important. The darker, so you take a look at that and the, the darker it is usually means the older it is and the, and the higher the proof. So I like to kind of begin the tasting journey with just a little bit of a, just looking at it, kind of admiring the color. Then you swirled around a little bit. Now this is, this takes a little bit of practice, but it looks like, you know, Golik's got it down. Mikey, you got, you guys are a couple of veterans here. I don't even know I'm even showing you how to swirl. You got, you, you got it down. <laughs> it's like, it's I just sit around with enough glasses. I was gonna say, I sit around with enough glasses of wine every night to where I've just got yeah, the you, sloshing motion you, down. You, you, you got it down, man. Um, and so you kind of look at the legs and it's like not like wine wine where the legs can you know it's about the sugar and this is about kind of like the the oils and the and the fatty acids that survive distillation and, and the barrel and uh, you can kind of identify a distillery by their legs it's kind of cool but this is wild turkey so a lot of people kind of associate wild turkey with like the the biker bars and everything but they really have some amazing amazing whiskey and so after you swirled around a little bit, bring it to your nose and uh, kind of go from nostril to nostril. One nostril is going to be stronger than the other. And, you know, in some cases, like Kyle Rudolph, you broke your nose and it works half ah. the time. <laughs> and then when you smell, smell with your mouth open. It relaxes the olfactory and you're able to get a little bit more in ju than just the... Uh, Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I, you know, I never knew that. That you're wow. Right. Boy, oh boy, that 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 does make a difference. See, this is so abnormal to me. I've usually just poured, and it's usually gone already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is. I'm that. I just learned a new trick there. That was incredible. Yeah, it all you 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 you'll pick up more than just the alcohol. What are you smelling on it? You know, when when I smell whiskey, it's probably the type of whiskey I bought or got in college or. It wasn't the best maybe in the world that it really kind of rocked me. This is very smooth smelling. I, I, I enjoy the smell very much, actually. Now, I'll throw out a couple uh, couple notes that I'm definitely getting in this. Chocolate and mm. coconut. See, I'm not good enough to, to get that. I, I, I'm not good enough. I'm getting the chocolate. Now that you mentioned the nostrils, I'm really only getting it in my right. Like that one seems to be working a lot better at this point. But now as soon as you said chocolate, I was like, oh yeah, there it is. So the, your your right nostril is your is your go-to. So there. Use the good nostril, I always say. You know, it's like the uh it's like the um 
the the game that ever the the play everybody has in Madden. You know, you got that one play that you always go to. That's your that's your right nostril. Engage eight for every check? defensive player. All right, so now let let's taste, and when you taste, just put a little bit on your tongue and kind of kind of work <laughs> it back. And Dad was ready to go right at that. He just thing. he just like he's, he said, "Taste my ass." <laughs> Yeah, I was. I was ready. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe I also need to put a space in between the portion of that statement at the end. <laughs> He's like, wow. taste. No, no, no. I had uh, I had to wake up for at four thirty every day for twenty five years. I'm drinking. <laughs> now I don't know if you put it in my head, but I get the chocolatey bit. Yeah. I mean, this and is kinda, and like Dad said, I was used to and you like you brought up. I was used to the wild turkey that we were shooting in college. Mm -hmm. This yes. is a much better experience. This is yeah, delightful. Yeah, the stuff we shot in college made my eyes water. Plus, I drank way more than a shot of it. This stuff is 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 much much better to sip. You know, and it's interesting. Wild turkey has a bit. You know, they're still trying to get over that. You know, that kind of mindset, and so they hired Matthew McConaughey, who comes in and. You know, as their celebrity spokesperson, I think that actually, I don't think that helped them very much with kind of losing well, it. But, well, I mean, all you can say is, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right, you know. Yeah. But they're Pair wild turkey fantastic. with your Lincoln and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. So you guys, you know, one of the things that, you know, Golik, I've been watching you, you know, for forever and listening to you forever. One of the things that I've always admired about you as a man is the kind of father you are like you always you always like um you know you kind of like set a really good example for for us younger fathers out there about how to you know how to be stern and how to and you you lived a very public life about that was that ever was that ever difficult to you know talk about your kids and then come home and and be dad after talking about them on the air no, it was great talking about them on the air because it was content. So I knew it was going to help the show because they did such stupid stuff <laughs> that I knew it would sound good. Uh, but, you know, I've lived a pretty much a public life since going to Notre Dame. There's a lot of notoriety and publicity. Then playing nine years in the NFL, you're kind of always, you know, out there to the public. So it was really nothing new. So that's just kind of the way. And, you know, we had Mike and Jake while I was still playing. So. You know, they were they were old enough to start bopping around the locker rooms and fields a little bit, you know, by the time I finished playing. So, you know, they, they were part of it from a young age. So and then I went right into uh, broadcasting. So I just it, it's not that I had to actually think about it. It's just something that was always a part of me. I always was used to being approached by people or being in the spotlight or knowing something that I do. If I do something bad, it's going to get out there. If I do something good, it's going to get out there. It's kind of always been like that. And I think the kids just kind of saw that as the years went by when I was broadcasting. What, so what did you, what was it like for, for you to, uh, to have a dad in the, in the public eye all, all, all the time. And now of course you're in the public eye. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was good practice. Like he mentioned for all the things that I wanted to do, which just happened to be the things that he wanted to do is, you know, someone I certainly looked up to in all those ways, but you know, going and playing football at a place like Notre Dame, you're going to have extra eyes on you. And I was used to that from a very early age, knowing and going around that when I did things and when I acted a certain way in public, it was reflective on more than just myself. And I think for me, my brother and sister, who all went on to play high-level athletics in college, it, it put you in that good mind state of knowing you needed to act right in order to accomplish the things that you wanted to do. And I think kind of living in that little fishbowl at the beginning. It was weird at first because you'd get people that would come up to you on the street when we were out at dinner, when we were in mm -hmm. middle school, high school, that knew, hey, I heard this is how it's going with X, Y, or Z sport that you were a part of. Or, hey, you know, I saw when you, you know, clanked your, uh, you know what, in the middle of a couple of dumbbells <laughs> while you were working out. And it's a little jarring at first, but after a while, you just kind of understand that this is what, you know, comes with the territory when, you have a show that wants to involve family the way that uh, it did for so long with dad. You know, and too, you, he, he, he created, uh, he created like people rooting for you, you know, like when you guys were in the national championship, 
You know, I, I'm not a Notre Dame fan. I didn't grow up a Notre Dame fan, even though I'm Catholic. I, I'm an Oklahoma State boy, and so you your your heart is where you always were. But that was the first time in my life I was rooting for a team that was was not my own. And that entire season, that journey, and of course, you know, he he didn't like talking about it after the game. But you know, we were all it felt he he it felt like he he created a following for you. You know, during that during that season. And, well, I uh, mean, the, the the one thing about doing radio is you put yourself out there and you just kind of lay your life out there, so people don't just turn you on to listen to what you're going to say about sports. They they kind of turn you on, especially in the morning, morning drive. You're kind of just getting up, you're heading off to work. I, I we always wanted to make it feel like you're just tuning in to a friend and we're just shooting the breeze. And and we've had so many people say, "Oh my God, I feel like I know you." and your family because of the show. And, and that's kind of what we wanted to create. So I think therein lies people rooting for the kids. And believe me, there are plenty of people rooting against them as well. Uh, yeah. no, 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 just just ask their mother. Um, uh, so it, it well. certainly goes both ways when you put yourself out there. Well, and in, in like that, that moment of like going on to, you know, that moment where he was like trying to, to make a team. You know, I, I think you you put yourself out there, but it also felt like, you know, and you were really, you really wanted it for your son. And all fathers can relate oh, to that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody, everybody wants every dad or parent wants their kid to to achieve what they're trying to achieve. People are always like, oh, are you happy your kids went to Notre Dame? I said, no, I'm happy my kids got to the school that they wanted to go to. It didn't have to be the school I went to or my brothers went to or anything like that. I wanted them, if they had a goal, we were proud as parents that they achieved their goal. Now, the goal happened to be Notre Dame, but we'd have been fine if they had gone anywhere, except, of course, USC, because that, that can't happen uh, if you're a Notre Dame person. Uh, but, but we really were. If, if, for whatever reason, Mike loved Nebraska and got to go to Nebraska, we would have been just as happy because it's somewhere he wanted to go. And he got there. So it's about your kids, you know, setting goals and achieving those goals and what make you proud. Or at least because you don't achieve them all, but mm -hmm. at least knowing that they put in their full effort to to achieve that goal. Well, just, uh, you know, as a, as somebody who who is looking for, you know, father, you know, people, role models to, to look up to, to, you know, about how to be a father. You know, cheers to you for for always setting that example for for your audience because it definitely came off that way. And when I think of you, go like I don't necessarily think of an ESPN host or I don't think of like you know nine years of football or anything like that. I always have thought of you as a father, and so cheers to you for that. And no, I, I appreciate that because and that's more important because being a father lasts a hell of a lot longer than you know the broadcasting career. That's for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, there's definitely, from all we can tell, you, you raised him right. And so now we, let's move on to uh, Beryl. Uh, this is the 15-year-old. This is my, this was my 2018, this was my 2018 American Whiskey of the Year. Uh, it won in a blind taste off, and you can find that uh, that story on Forbes. But this is a... This is a what they call a blend of straight bourbon whiskeys. Now, little, so bourbon, bourbon is a protected term. So, in 1964, bourbon was declared a unique product of the United States, and so no other country in the world could, you know, make a, a, a liquor and slap the word bourbon on it. And if they do that, they'll get the full arm of the United States government coming after them in a. And when we negotiate with people for trade agreements, the, the respective country has to adhere to our terms of what bourbon is. I mean, it's an actual negotiating point, which is why bourbon is getting tariffed right now uh, by other countries. And it is uh, when you see the word blend of straight bourbons, that means it's coming from various states or various distilleries. But it's still a it's still basically you know in a nutshell still bourbon so this is a blend of straight bourbons 
which means they have to be at least two years old from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana. So this is a very unique product. It, it doesn't have nearly the smell of the wild turkey. I don't think. I'm just thrown off that now my left nostril is the one that's working. Oh, you, you've broken that one in. So it sounds like the the barrel is the is is more left left nostril centric here. Yeah. Is that a thing, or are you just setting us up on that one? <laughs> no, that's no, a real thing. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. like my dad when I Cause... my dad was a bricklayer when he would go tell me to get the left handed hammer, which of <laughs> of course I went and looked for it, and there is none. So I, I thought you were setting us up there. And to no. be clear, you could tell us that, and we would 100% yeah, we believe you. <laughs> oh, that's very smooth. Yeah, it's very it's a, smooth. It, you'd be shocked to know that this is 106.5 proof. Really? Wow. Yeah. But it's, boy, I, okay, this would be deadly for me because it's really yeah. smooth. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is, we call this trouble. Yes, this, this was uh, this was uh, Kyle Rudolph's favorite when we did our when we did it, our this, tasting. This is really good. This may be tough to beat, though. We'll see. So uh, there's a. I know you love. I know you love donuts, and you love you love all the sweet foods. Have you ever had a a French uh, baked good called marzipan? You ever had marzipan? I, I may have and not known what I was eating, quite honestly. So it, it's a honey and an almond kind of paste, and they put it on like uh, um, a lot of uh, pastries in, in France. This has one of the most, one of the strongest marzipan notes, you know, that, that I've ever had. And so like, so think honey, think like almonds and, and, like, a, and like a pastry goodness. No wonder I liked it so much. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you just described all things that are good. Right? Exactly. Oh, wow. So, Mike, Mikey, when you got out of, uh, when you got out of Notre Dame and you were, you were making a, you were making a run for the, for, for the NFL and you kept getting, um, you kept getting cut and cut and we'd, we'd hear about that. What was, what was the moment that you knew that it was time, you know, to hang up the cleats. Yeah, I think for me that the wheels started turning on that sometime in the spring of 2015, where I understood it was the third year I had had in that window. And I always kind of went in with the understanding that I would have probably a good three-year opportunity to try and latch on somewhere before the sands of time and subsequent draft classes start adding up. And I got – the fortunate opportunity to go back. I had been with the New Orleans Saints the offseason prior up until June when I was cut there and had made the round robin tour through the CFL and the FXFL and other bits of God knows what mixed in along the way. <laughs> but I got the chance to go back with the New Orleans Saints uh, that next spring of 15. And I knew going into that camp that was going to be my last best chance. I had been moving around, basically living on couches for three years. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give it my absolute best shot here try and put some great stuff on tape, really put my best foot forward again. And if it doesn't work out, the way I always thought about it was, I need a job that's going to start liking me too, because at that point, professional football did not seem to have much of an affinity for me. And so, you know, I was fortunate my last preseason game and ended up being my last football game was preseason four. We played the Green Bay Packers at Lambeau Field. So got to see that historic venue, went out there, felt like I played some good ball and Ultimately, it didn't work out, and at that point, I was like, you know what? There's really not much more at this point in time that I feel like I can do. I've had the opportunities. They haven't worked out, and so it, it, at that point, I had already been doing some things on the side, kind of with a foot in the broadcasting world, but at that point, I decided it was probably the time to go full go with it. Yeah. Mike, what, what was that like for you, seeing your seeing your son go through that? Well, I mean, tough. I mean, you know, I, I watched Mike go through it. I watched Jake go through it, you know, putting their, their best foot forward and, and doing everything that they in their power could do to to make it in the league. You know, and uh, as Mike said, you know, three different camps, the XFXFL, I never say that right, uh, the Canadian League, you know, trying every outlet he could. And 
you know, it's, it's my kid, me and my wife's kid. So you're hurt like crazy for him. But, you know, unfortunately it happens to, to thousands of players that just miss it. I mean, twice he was in the last cut you know, it's right there. The, the difference between the last cut and guys on the team is razor thin. Sometime it's some guy maybe getting hurt in the right spot where you get more of an opportunity to show what you have. You know, uh, you, you never know what that when or how that opportunity is going to arise. And uh, for Mike, he, he did, as he said, all he can. And and you become self-aware of saying, OK, you know, I, I've tried all the outlets I can try and, and now I'm going to need to move on. And while I know he would have loved to play in the NFL, um, he's obviously doing great in this business and will continue to do great in this business. Yeah, I mean, who knew he'd be such a such a talented broadcaster? I mean, everybody, he's... believe me, oh, everybody this kid <laughs> just talked all the time. I mean, his brother Jake, who's a year and a half younger, you know, used to is is known for half sentences because he would start them, and Mike would always take over from there. Mike took up all the oxygen in the room. So there is, I think, if you ask any of his teammates in high school and college, uh, and even his teammates in training camps, that. They say, hey, Golick ended up in broadcasting. They go, well, yeah, that's not a shock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got, you, you have such a good rapport with with all of your with all of your co-hosts that I've seen you with. Is that do you ever have someone that you just you just don't mesh with, and you're like trying to find a way to to get the you know the get the duo down? Yeah, you know what? Every once in a while it pops up, but uh, I've been pretty fortunate. We got a lot of good people at ESPN, a lot of people who, I mean, obviously you work in sports, so it's we'd say it's you're working in Candyland half the time with what we get to cover and the subject matter we get to dive into. And so most people have a good understanding of that and are pretty aware, and the attitude generally tends to reflect that. I've also been fortunate because I get to work a lot with people that I genuinely consider friends. We got a great group of young staff, young talent around here who are all really motivated and, and trying to make a name for this. And I think finding those like-minded people has made it a lot easier. You, I rarely find a situation where you walk into a room and someone's not willing to try and have a good time with you while we're telling all these sports stories. You know, yeah. Well, I, well, I got to work with Mike and, and, 25 years, it'll still be the best part of the work, getting able to work with your kid. You can't beat that. Um, I, I do think where Mike is now, it's good. I mean, I know he enjoyed working with me. We, it, it, it was cool to turn on the mics at 6 a.m. and be able to shoot the breeze. But, you know, when he was doing the show with me and Trey Wingo, it's a couple of 58-year-old guys, one being your dad. I, I like where he's at now. He's with people his own age, as they, you know, and, uh, and they can, they can really kind of dive into a lot more. We had our fun you know, going from generation to generation and seeing how things kind of collide. But uh, I, I love the group he has now from his co-host and the people behind the glass who are so important to his show. They got a great mix going on, and that's so important when you're doing three, four-hour shows to have that chemistry. Yeah, and, you know, anytime, you know, anytime you jump on and you guys are kind of going back and forth, I always – you always do a, a, a good job, and this is a very different time to be talking about sports, you know, I, I, I feel like we talk a lot less about sports. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is, no, it's no the sports. truth, but it's, yeah, we didn't have anything at the time and you know, we, you have to go with what's there and what the athletes are telling people. And as people have talked about, you know, whether it's politics or social issues making their way into sports, we've seen the real human beings that athletes are asserting those parts of their lives into the field of play because they have things that matter enough to them to try and get out there. So it's, it's our job to cover that, to use our experience in the locker rooms, in those situations to try our best to, to help further that conversation. Yeah, and you, and you guys do it in a way that's, you know, that the, that the public needs to hear, you know, the, there's not a, um, I, I find that there's a, you know, especially your team, I, I find there's the perfect balance there. And, you know, I on my little show of, uh, you know, talking whiskey, you know, I've 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 covered uh, the Black Lives you know Matter movement, you know, with people. I've got, you know, Killer Mike coming on here pretty soon. And it's a it, it's it's one of those things. It's like if you have a platform right now, 
it's like there's almost a responsibility to have these difficult social discussions and you know i i think you do a good job with it thank you appreciate I, that appreciate that and you know you just have to kind of go with what's what's happening and that's obviously such a serious topic but uh you know i i i also can't wait for sports to be back as well because that that's kind of what we enjoy talking about the most so now that um now that we've went through these, uh, we've went through uh, the Russells, the Wild Turkey Russells. We've hit the Barrel Craft uh, Bourbon, the 15-year-old. Now I'm going to ask you all to pour the uh, Orphan Barrel, the 24-year-old. And I and I do have a, a smidgen of a drop here. <laughs> a smidgen. So I'll be able to put a little bit on my tongue. Won't really be able to smell it. So just so you know, 24 years is a very long time for a bourbon. Yes, it is. You it's know, a very long time for anything. It's a it's an old <laughs> bourbon. <laughs> I'm getting a hint of something that I can't. That I bet if you say it, I'll say yeah. That's it. Now let me smell the bottle because the drop is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Got to it quick. Uh, maybe it maybe apple pie. There's like an a, a, a apple pie coming out of the oven on that one for me. Holy smokes! I love your your smell. <laughs> I guess it, we have good we have good sniffers on us here. But it's not like we're strangers to smells. It's the descriptions that we need work on right here. So, and you're speaking our language, going directly to baked goods. Well, that's that's right. That, that, that one has a little more bite than the than the last one we tried, the, the, the bourbon mixtures we tried. So that is actually a much lower in proof. I think this is this is uh yeah, so this is a touch over ninety proof. So that's about twenty degrees lower in proof than the previous one. So, so is what, what I'm saying not making sense? No, it, it no, it's a, it, it's just kind of a you know, when we the the term smooth is used a lot. But right. really People look, people look at proof as an indication of smooth when really that's not the case at all. Uh, you know, something can be 120 proof and burn less on your palate than something right. that's that's 80 proof. And it's really okay. about it's about the flavors. And you all are talking about like, you, you know, you can smell it, but you can't describe it. You know, I, I used a technique called mindfulness and that like it's basically tracing everything that I have smelled or tasted and trying to lock it in my memory and I'm seeking those things out as I as I am tasting you know so uh, it, it's it in 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 with whiskey baked goods man if you if you are strong with the donuts and the pies like that you know i mean that's like <laughs> that's like working out for a whiskey taster is eating eating all those uh, fatty foods Say no more. We fit. That's why we fit right in around here. Yeah, I mean, this is yeah. So this is what I do for working out. I eat. I eat pies and uh, <laughs> you know fried goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Sounds. Like, I can say I think I'm ready for a career switch. You know it. We're we we need more tasters in the world. So I, I'm I'm having a little bit of a I, I'm diff, I don't know where I want to take you next. I don't know if I want to go to the revival. Or the will it next? This is a this is a tough call because you know in a in a series of tastings, if you take a if you take a left turn, it can it can hurt you on the on the final one. So I think I'm going to stay in the bourbon category. We'll finish with the rise. So we're going to go to the will it. I appreciate it. You're like the you're like the bourbon offensive coordinator right now, trying to figure out the best run pass mix. Yeah. It's the truth. Now this is um, if if you were to put like a, a list of Hall of Fame, you know, bourbon distilleries of like what everybody wants, you know, this would be like a this would be like a Jim Brown, um, you know, something that everybody really respects and thinks is you know puts out a lot of great liquid uh, so this bottle right here which is is very very difficult to come by only 129 
uh, bottles of this particular single barrel. This is a 15-year-old uh, Willet, and it was um, it was a gift to me by a mutual friend that uh, Kyle Rudolph and I have. And this is, I'm smelling it, and I'm like, oh, my God. Well, that's good. I like that. That, 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 like you just said, Hall of Fame. It smells. I don't know what the like the taste sensation would be, but it smells powerful. Like it just yeah. smells like respect. <laughs> smells like respect. A little R E S P C T. I love it. Like that. Yeah, that one really hits the that one. Whatever the flavor is, it really hits the back of the tongue a lot. It it does. I I think that was the most flavorful. Um, I, I'd like I'd like the, the fifteen year fifteen year barrel from the from the taste, but that this will it it did it kind of struck me when when I when I ah. so when your your tongue. Your tongue gets the the tip uh, on the tip of the tongue. You get the sweet notes. In the middle, you get like your savory notes, like your cornbreads and your pie crust. And in the back, you get your spice. Uh, and so that would be like uh, cinnamon, um, you know, pepper spices, hatch chilies, you know, things like that. So the fact that you all are able to like trace where it's hitting on your palate. Just shows me that you all have great tasting potential here. So we're great drinkers. Good, good <laughs> prospects. You, you might you might make the team. There you go. Good. As we talked about, I'm sick of getting cut. <laughs> <laughs> so I know. Looks like you guys are down on them pretty quickly. So uh, I was going to say go back to the other one, but then. I don't think you have much left. Like you're, you, you, you guys are crushing them. Yeah, they're pretty much gone. <laughs> Listen, I always said you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. Yeah, and, you know, you, I, you never leave anything in the glass. So, do you have like, do you have like a a, a little liquor sh little liquor spot at ESPN, or can you say? Oh no, you 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 really can't there. That's why. We, we separate church and state there. At least I do. I don't know about Mike. <laughs> I, uh, I I do at the moment. I don't have a desk or an office that would be able to facilitate like a spot where I could hide that. I have a very public cubicle. So hiding any good stuff there, I would more, more be concerned about any of my coworkers finding out it was there and coming yeah. by to grab it. So I've got the vault at home here with any and all liquor that I've got on file out the cabinet safe from all my friends all right so <laughs> if you've got if you've got a nice bottle of bourbon that's sent to you in the office and it's on your desk you're going into the kitchen or bathroom and it comes back gone who's the most likely suspect who are you going after first who took it in my in the family yeah let's no go. in the at work oh wingo <laughs> Wingo, Wingo. I mean, that dude takes more Instagram pictures of having drinks by a fire than anybody I ever know. <laughs> I would be worried about Jason Fitz, lifetime in Nashville. Yeah, you know he's 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 used to that scene, and I feel like it's in his palate. And if there's anything free to be had potentially, and to be clear, if it's in one of our possessions and Jason can take it, that's free to him. I have a feeling he'd be going after it. He and he's a big fan of mischief. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I was going to – I was thinking um, – I was thinking like Charles Woodson, you know. He's uh, he's kind of a – from what I'm told, he's a bit of a whiskey guy. Do not know that. And a lot of guys like that, the analysts, they don't live there either. They just come in to do their shows and then leave. So we don't really see him around the office much when he was with us. Mm-hmm. He, he does look like he would pair well with a whiskey drinking setting with like the outfits he goes with and like yeah, see, the ornate he scarps got, and everything. He's, he's got a fellow the ascot wear. He's a fellow ascot yeah. wear. So, <laughs> you know, there's like he, he and I are the, we're it, you know, <laughs> we're, the, yeah. we're the only two in the world. Not many of us. So, 
So now as we go to the Wild Turkey Revival, so this is this is a this is a new style of American whiskey. A little controversial, as uh, as I stated that bourbon it has to be made in the United States. It is also a very also has a very rigid definition that it has to be predominantly corn. There's a bunch of technical things to it, but the most important piece is that it has to go into a new charred oak barrel. And if it is not in a new charred oak barrel, then it is not bourbon. So what has started to happen in the last uh, 10, 15 years, there's a lot of people who are taking the bourbon and putting it in another barrel. And it's like a finishing. They call it a finishing barrel, which is very common in Scotland and in rum. And But in bourbon, you know, the old guard has kind of kept that from happening. And this is finished in Oloroso sherry cask, you know, so like a sherry with, you know, S-H, not cherry. And um, and so while this is very, very good, it is it, it skews toward a little bit on that, you know, controversial uh, style of whiskey. I like it. The bad boy of whiskeys. Yeah. Revival. This is the wild turkey revival. Oh, yeah. Does it taste like a bad boy? Yeah, it's got a bite to it. <laughs> it knows it's breaking the rules. <laughs> it. And it doesn't care. Leather jacket, yeah. cigarette in hand, sitting out by the no smoking sign at the high school. I'm I'm getting beef notes. Tastes like beef. Beef. It tastes like beef, like, like brisket. Hmm. So is it is it like a smoke? Is it like a smoky it's, smokiness. It's more like a it's more like a smoked one because it's a little saltier, almost like something cured. Yeah. Look at you. Wow. That is um, that's fantastic. Look at that. I'm just working. shooting my I'm just shooting nope. my shot now because worst case scenario, I'm wrong and you'll just tell me a better comp for it. No, no, no. There's exactly no right. wrong. Look, I can't like you're tasting. What, that's the thing is like a is like a critic. I always try to tell people like this is just my opinion. This is just what I'm tasting, and what I'm tasting is definitely not going to be what you're tasting. So that kind of like cured, uh, kind of saltiness, like smoke. That is a very common note, um, and you'll see a lot of people refer to it as briny. Uh, you'll see yeah. people refer to it as like an oyster shell from time to time. And, you know, there's like there's like a lot of common descriptors, but um, I definitely get, you know, like a smoke smoke note here. A bit of, um, you know, it reminds me I, I could go for some brisket at the moment. <laughs> yeah. That, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm just glad I didn't slip up and say beef jerky, considering I'd been at the gas station buying some not too long ago. So maybe uh, that's uh, where they're called. What, what's your go to beef jerky? Ooh, go to beef jerky. The teriyaki guy? Yeah, yeah. I usually like that black pepper. Mm. Do you do you do you like it kind of moist or do you like it the crunchy kind of beef jerky? No, I like it moister, yeah. Yeah. Well, cause we so we've gone out like and I don't know a ton of guys that make their own jerky, but Mark Zona, who was on the Bassmaster tour, who's mm -hmm. a good friend of dad, still works in commentating on a lot of the Bassmaster events. We got to go out fishing with him. Dad's been out a few times, but when I went out with him, Mark made his own beef jerky, brought it out in the boat with us, and it was good, moist cuts, and just unbelievably seasoned. So I, I think I'm biased towards that idea of a little, a little bit more moisture, just because of my uh, probably best jerky experience with him. So, boys, what is your what's your ranking here? What's your what's your favorite? I go with the the barrel, the 15 year old. And then the uh, Willet 15 year old. And then I think the Orphan's Barrel. The Russell's Private Barrel and the Wild Turkey Revival. So Barrel is number one for the, the Willet 15. Yeah, Barrel 15 year, yes. Yeah, I'm with that on that one. I got the Barrel first, the Willet second. 
I think I switched the Russells and the uh, 24 year in the third and fourth slot. Mm. And then the uh, the bad boy of whiskey coming in fifth, an admirable effort, but it was just up against, like you said, some current Hall of Famers, some future Hall of Famers. Going to be a difficult one to top. Yeah, this this was a this was a fun lineup because they kind of, except for the last one, they kind of complemented each other. And you remember when I was saying like, if if you taste the Wild Turkey Revival, you're not going to appreciate the Willet as much. So we had to, I had to be careful there not to taste that one too soon because that one could jack your palate a little bit. It's a, yeah. it's a little different. We had a good whiskey coordinator. Well, you know, that's uh, – I, I like this new term, uh, whiskey coordinator. You know, it's uh, – um, it, it beats the heck out of critic. I don't really like the term critic, but, you know, I, I, it gets thrown on me. And, it, you know, I, I have to take it because that's what I technically am. But I like coordinator better. I'm going to start go. using that. Yeah. So as we look into, like, what the world of sports is going to be like for the next – three months any any predictions on uh what we can anticipate well i i think i think especially football it's going to start like college football started it's just going to be a matter as it finishes so i think everybody's going to push through to try and make it all start and then we just got to see how far it can go yeah yeah i i think in, in a lot of cases and i was on the call actually It'd be some weird trivia question answer in the future. I was on the call for the first college football game of 2020, the first college football game post pandemic with Austin P in central Arkansas last night. And we don't know if it was COVID related, but we know that D'Angelo Wilson, who was Austin P's best wide receiver, didn't make the trip with the team. And those kind of adjustments the teams mm-hmm. are going to have to make are probably going to be the norm all year. We've seen leagues like major league baseball have disruptions, have to put games on pause. I think we'll see that for college. I think we'll see that for the NFL if you're one of these non-bubble sports that you're going to have to show an ability to weather the storm if you ultimately want to push through and have a season. Well, gentlemen, as as we sign off, uh, what's next for you? What's next for you, Mike? Golf. Lots of golf. Lots of golf. (laughs) I was hoping he was going to say bourbon. I was hoping he was going to say bourbon. Well, you know, after golf, maybe instead of that beer, I'll have that bourbon after my round. Well, Peyton Manning's got a got a bourbon, so you know, hit yeah. him up for that bottle. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. We need to get the Mike Golick Senior bottle. Yeah, you know what? I'll get some sent to you. Well, gentlemen, thank you all so much for for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Um, you two have been a part of my life on on the TV or in the in the car for for a long time. So it's great to share a dram with you, and I'll just toast you. With uh, with all of our favorite for the for this taste off barrel fifteen year old, if you have any left, cheers. Well, mine's gone, but I appreciate that. I'll still put up. A <laughs> cheers, <glass>. cheers. <laughs> all right, guys, be safe out Thanks. there, and um, stay away from vodka. Just drink the good stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> cheers. See you. Bye.